have some nice refreshments. Um, I wanted to welcome you here to our annual meeting and uh, in this very beautiful building and room here at Northern Essex. So we want to thank our host from Northern Essex and hope all you're here to make sure you have a beautiful sunset view of St. Mary's. It's the best view of that in the city here. Um, we are having our 39th annual meeting and uh, we'll call the meeting to order. And last year we were at the Lawrence History Center, so we will have Karen talk about the minutes from last year's meeting. Hi everyone, <laughs> I'm Karen Kirby, I'm the, the Secretary, the Board Secretary. Uh, I don't know if people have copies of the minutes. Uh, They're in your packet. Last year. Uh, if you want to take a look at those, uh, we had, um, what I'm going to call for is a, a motion to approve, approve the minutes unless the people have corrections that they want to make. To the minutes. We're going to send around some more agendas yeah. and minutes in case you didn't grab one in the back there.
but I think we're, we're moving in that direction um, and will not say no to any foundation support. So um, we will continue to accept it, <laughs> to, even if the percentage goes high. And then earned other revenue, we, we get earned revenue through event ticket sales, our annual road race, our Dangler event, um, the museum shop membership, research service fees, and educational services. So mm -hmm. that makes up the other bit of revenue. Did anyone have any questions? Yeah. Is there a motion to accept? Thank you, Jonas. Second. Thank you, Jim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone stay? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, Kathleen Curry, one of our vice, our vice president, will be presenting the nominating report. Um, it's on page three. If you wanted to follow along. <coughs> This is the board, slate of board members for 2017 to 2018. Um, the first change and highlight is that Pamela Yameen is stepping down as president. In her new role will be immediate past president. She'll still be part of the executive board committee and help transition Mike Hearn into his new role as president. Thank you, Pam, for 12 great years. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. But you're not going anywhere, so just um, I will continue for a second term as vice president. As I said, Mike Hearn has graciously stepped up and got us a sweet place for this meeting um, <laughs> as president. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, Ellen has agreed to a second term as treasurer. Sarah Morin is taking our secretary role over, which we're very excited about. Um, Mark is still hanging around, thank you Mark, but he is now second vice president, so he's my partner in crime, which I'm very excited about. Wimper will continue for his third term, Mark Cutler for his first term, Rob Forent, his second term is still rolling in, um, Mayor Guerrero has agreed to a second term, thank you. Um, and Karen Herman is stepping down from secretary position after 12 years. You guys like ruled the place for 12 years. Um, um, but has agreed to stay on as a board member, so thank you very much for that. Um, Yadira will continue her first term. Rich Padova will continue his fourth term. And um, James Sutton has agreed to extend to a third term, so thank you very much for that. And. Um, any questions, thoughts? So we kept our, our happy little group together for one more year. So um, we'll always look for new board members, but this just seemed like a great thing this year. So can I have a motion to accept our slate for 2017? So Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. We'll do really good work, I promise. <laughs> Well, yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate everybody on their new roles um, at the Lawrence History Center, especially the new executive team. Um, you know, for many years, the History Center has had wonderful boards that brought it forward, and I want to thank all of past board members, the staff, present and past, and volunteers, present and past because you got us to a great place today where we can take on new leadership and um, entrust it to a strong board and really will support the wonderful work of our executive director, Susan Brabsky, Amita Kiley, our collections manager, Kathy Flynn, our head researcher, and the many volunteers that we have. And um, I look forward to staying involved with the History Center in whatever way mm -hmm. best serves it. And um, I just wish them all the best. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about our past board members, but I didn't know if Mike wanted to say a few words before we moved on. Sure. <laughs> um, I just want to say how happy I am to be given this opportunity. It's, it's very humbling to be asked to serve in this capacity. Um, the Lawrence History Center overall is in a very strong position right now, and that does not happen by accident. It's, it's a tribute not just to, to the work of, of Susan and her staff, but it's also a tribute to, to the, the president of, and, and Pamela, Pamela the president of the organization for, for a number of years. Um, my intention is to continue the strong work that the organization is already doing 
Uh, and with the strong team I have with me, I have no doubt that we continue to do that. So thank you to, to Pamela and Karen, who's also going to off the board, um, and we'll take care of things for you. <laughs> Congratulations to our, your executive team. Um, as they said, um, in addition to my stepping down, Karen Herman, who has been our secretary for a long time, is um, also going to be uh, changing her role as a board member. And we just wanted to acknowledge all the great work that she's done. Um, I remember when Earth uh, um, brought Karen or to the board and you know said I want to invite this great person because she recognized Karen's talent and all the civic work that she does and realizes that Karen's sense of process would help the, L the History Center achieve what we were trying to do as we transitioned from a volunteer driven board to becoming an important Lawrence institution. And um, as Karen describes herself, she's vitally interested in history, community, architecture, and material culture. And she has looked for ways to blend her volunteer interests and her practice as an artist. And also <coughs> that the preservation of community character helps people discover a pride of place and develop a new sense of awareness about where they live and work. And wanting to share that with everybody so that they engage and make their community stronger. And Karen has really been wonderful combining all those wonderful things and collaborating with many institutions and making all of them stronger. Um, I know that she strengthens the work of all the people around her and she gave me the support to lead the History Center throughout all its growing pains and it's um, become a great community organization through um, efforts like hers. And she's been throughout it consistent, reliable, enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic support and she's guided us through many facilities enhancements as well as wonderful Dengler events where she would work closely with the honorees and bring their stories to life and connect them to the History Center. And we just want to thank her for her many years of service to the History Center Executive Committee as Secretary and we look forward to her continued participation on the committee, the Facilities Committee and Collections Committee as well as her work as a board member. So. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Karen. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure for me to be on the Lawrence History Center board. Um, I was very inspired by Eartha uh, long ago when she was involved. We were both involved with the Antler Historical Society. And, um, mm -hmm. To come to the History Center and be part of, of the growth and part of the new programming and the Dangler Award and meeting all the great people awards that I've been able to meet in the past number of years. I just I love I love working here and interacting with everybody and and hoping that, that everyone works together to build community. That's I think that's really, really important. So thank you for the kind words and <laughs> the opportunity to participate. Thank you and everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. So as was mentioned uh, when we were approving this slate, Pamela Yumi is stepping into an immediate past president role, which is significant not just for Pam, but also for the organization. Pam has led this organization as president for 12 years, but in our 39 years, Pam has been involved for seven or eight of them <laughs> in varying roles as a volunteer, as someone who did research, as somebody who um, held other board officer positions or just traditional board roles. She really has given her all to this organization. Um, but she's very modest and so <laughs> finding out that history isn't always easy. But um, I was able to steal Pam away for a little while to, to get her thoughts on her time here at the History Center and on. I'm just going to read what the summary we came up with was. But Pamela Yamin began her affiliation with the Lawrence History Center, founded in 1978 as the Immigrant City Archives, after she graduated from Wheaton College in 1979. She first met Eartha Dangler, our founder, at the Lawrence Heritage State Park at a time when the importance of historic preservation was just starting to be realized. At that time, Pamela was working on an exhibit for the ALAA, or the American Lebanese Awareness Association, which resulted in a Lebanese exhibit for the Immigrant City Archives that helped grow their ethnic collection. Pamela proceeded to volunteer her time working on the 
the Lawrence History Center slide collection, was soon invited to join the board of directors by Eartha. Pamela excelled in growing the organization membership, raising funds, and orchestrating a myriad of events. Pamela's role on the board afforded her many opportunities to strengthen the organization. She moved into officer positions fairly early on and has led the organization as president for the last 12 years. Across several decades, several decades through both lean times and positions of strength, Pamela's efforts and leadership allow us to pass on to her successor an organization that is strong in its collections, programming, and financial well-being. Under her long-term leadership, Pamela has helped to transition the organization from a volunteer and founder-driven organization to professionally, a professionally staffed, board-driven organization. She's built a board of directors that is able to engage the community of Lawrence, grow the collections, and meet the needs of the organization. Design a vibrant mix of programs, an active and interactive social media presence, and events that create a sense of place and engagement in Lawrence for Laurentians from around the corner or around the world. She's helped to preserve the Essex Company Complex at 6 Essex Street in Lawrence, a site located on the National Register of Historic Places. The Essex Company built the city of Lawrence, and the Lawrence History Center is preserving their home and the collections within. She's helped organize and make accessible the collections in-house and through digitization efforts. And the, most importantly, perhaps, is furthering the goals and vision of Eartha Dangler and the History Center's mission to collect, preserve, share, and animate the history and heritage of Lawrence and its people. She shared with me that her, perhaps her, the thing that she's most proud of are the three humanities and collection-based academic symposiums <coughs> that we've held since 2012, and with a fourth one scheduled in 2018, which is our, uh, around public health, which is our theme across this year, and encouraging community, the community around scholarly research at all levels, and it ha that, that has made the History Center an active partner locally and through expanding networks nationally. Pamela has great respect for her fellow board members, staff, and volunteers, and their continued efforts. She holds her successor, Mike Hearn, in high regard, confident in his ability to lead the 2017-2018 Board of Directors and LHC Forward as its 40th anniversary of purchase. Many people have been sending in comments to me, quotes, sentiments, and I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to give them to you for you to read later. So this is for you to take. But we do have... Um, some sentiments from Minnesota. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Claudia Dangler is um, Eartha Dangler's daughter and has been very much involved with us. Hi, my name is Claudia Dangler. I'm happy to be here with you tonight. I'm Eartha Dangler's daughter and I'm so happy to be part of this celebration of Pamela Yamin's service to the Lawrence History Center. I have three things I would like to say to you tonight. First, the very thing that brought my mother to the mission of this organization, collecting, preserving, sharing the immigrant story. And my personal belief, and I suspect for many of you as well, that so much of the power and beauty of our nation is formed by the dreams, the labor, the determination of our newest arrivals. Certainly in my lifetime, I've never felt more protective of these new Americans and their journey to a new life than I have today. Second, I would like to acknowledge the ability of the Lawrence History Center to survive, evolve, and enjoy the respect of the community. And it's the result of the very good leadership that they have had for the organization for the last 40 years. I was in my 20s when my mother began this wobbly journey. <laughs> Um, had it not been for a few key people who joined Eartha and gave their time and ideas and values to the development of this tiny but powerful organization, I'm pretty sure that neither the Immigrant City Archives, as it was known then, or my mother would have survived those formative and often rather difficult days. We mustn't ever underestimate the difference that we can make to a small, fragile thing whether it be a person, an idea, or a community, or an organization. And lastly, and 
the point of all of this really is to say that there's one person here tonight without whose leadership and above all their participation, we likely would not be here celebrating 39 years. And that is Pamela Yamin. I've worked in the nonprofit sector for 50 years. I know that sounds like a long time, but I started very young at the YMCA and YWCA right here in Lawrence. And I can't think of another person um, who has devoted more selflessly her time and energy and commitment to a single mission and organization than Pamela Yamin. Her steady hand, her sincerity, her great questions, her unflappability, her patience, her kindness, her courage, her tact, her hard work, her personal integrity, her tenderness, and her personal generosity. <clears throat> All of it, just a bundle of the right things in the right person at the right time. And with her usual sense of good timing and her justified confidence in the solid future that is there for the Lawrence History Center, she is handing over the reins. I want to acknowledge the good sense that the board has shown in supporting this kind of sustained leadership. A lot of organizations would have succumbed to the faulty notion that change is always good. Pamela will be a tough act to follow, but only because the glow of her leadership will shine over the organization for years to come. Lucky is the new leader who gets to take on the reins and um, sustain the kind of leadership that this organization has enjoyed for so long. And it's a bittersweet moment to let the celebration um, of her departure be a source of joy for all of us, but let it also be a source of inspiration. And lastly, of course, I'm pretty sure that my mother is watching all of this. Uh, in fact, I'm certain of it. And um, I think she's grinning from ear to ear in knowing the wonderful work that's been done and is still to come. Thanks to all of you and to Pamela Yamin particularly for making one immigrant's dream come true. Thank you so much. I wish I was there with you tonight and enjoy your evening. Bye. more things for you. First, um, Thank you. I'm planting this. Oh, thank you. We have a citation from the mayor's office. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm not going to read the whole <laughs> thing because it is quite lengthy and a lot of it. Thank you. So, that, so that's from the mayor's office, and we thank Mayor Dan Daniel Rivera for presenting that. Um, the other citation is from mm -hmm. Congresswoman Nikki Salmis's oh, office. Thank you. Very enthusiastic <laughs> response to my inquiry as to whether they would. And so, the United States House of Representatives Certificate of Special Congressional Recognition presented to Pamela Yameen in honor of your more than 35 years of dedicated service as board member of the Lawrence History Center, including outstanding leadership as president, excuse me, for the last 12, and for your commitment to preserving the history and immigrant culture of the city of Lawrence by building a strong organization dedicated to honoring the past while embracing the future and by bringing scholarly research into the community as it celebrates its heritage you have instilled a pride of place to residents throughout the community. Thank you very much. Can you say more or tell? Um, um, just so thank you very much. It's it's been an honor and a privilege. And as I said before, I um, you know I appreciate working um, with all the past and present staff, volunteers, and board members. And I know that. I leave it in good hands, and I look forward to all the good work to come. Thank you for these lovely recognitions, and I look forward to a nice evening with you all.
adjourn the business meeting and we'll move on. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we have some wonderful speakers with us today from the Tewksbury Public Health Museum. And we'll hear from them in a little bit. But first, um, I'd just like to give a brief overview of the year. And Amita Kiley, our collections manager, will do the same as to what occurred in research and collections. Um, annual report's not done, but that will be the cover, likely. <laughs> you never know. It could change. Um, you've heard a lot about what we do. And the things that stick out to me as, as what has really strengthened us over the last several years is regular programming established events and events and programs that engage different audiences. So four years ago, um, we started a road race. Ellen Minzner is our chair, uh, our, a chair of our road race committee. She's also a world championship uh, level rower and, um, and is very engaged in um, athletics and so forth. And so she thought we would, um, and along, I think, Kathleen had an idea related to the 5K too. Anyway, um, but um, we started this 5K race to run, to, to raise money, but also engage an audience that we would never have engaged otherwise. Um, we had our, as I said, our fourth 5K. We have um, consistently uh, brought in close to four or $5,000 from this event. And this past year, the Merrimack Valley Striders came and um, that's a really good sign for a small race <laughs> because they're a huge organization and they have given us some pointers and I believe are going to put us on their calendar next year. So we hope to grow this race significantly next spring. Um, and I think it's May 22nd. So come on out and run it. I'm looking at Armin right now. <laughs> I'm out there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, and this year, this year we made it a, a run run, walk, roll to engage people of all abilities, because um, that's something that Ellen is, uh, does with her Paralympic team, which took a silver medal in Rio, um, in the Rio Olympics. So, um, we didn't, so we hope to grow that access to, to people of all abilities. Next year. Uh, we honored four wonderful people at our Eartha Dangler event, um, one of whom is in the room. Is that correct? Yes, Joe didn't pop in. Okay, <laughs> we honored Jimbo Shane, Joe Bella, and Linda and Eric Ziegenthaler. A wonderful event up on the sixth floor of the Woodmill. You can see from the background that it was just a stunning space, unfinished space, um, over um, on Merrimack Street. Sal Lapoli now owns the building, so it's probably already leased up. But um, but we we took the opportunity to be in the space, and um, I think they were wonderful honorees and nice night. Um, our summer program. This is the third year we offered um, a Andover bread loaf based uh, program for middle schoolers. We call it the Rising Loaves. Mary Guerrero is our co-director, has been with us. It was her idea. <laughs> um, and, so, um, and this year the program grew by like, uh, I don't know for that, percentages, but we, we used to have about 26 kids and we finished up with I think 40 or 41 this, this year. So it's word of mouth a lot of times with your programs, but we partner with Phillips Academy and the Bread Loaf program there. We got lovely funding from the UMass President's Office through a, a Creative Economy grant um, that was uh, awarded because of the efforts of our board member, Professor uh, Robert Foran. And um, these are just some scenes from, from what happens. We anchor it in history. The theme was public health, healthy me, healthy Lawrence. And the students learned about the history of public health in the city. They went on walking tours to the new Ferris site. Um, Kathy Flynn gave a, a lovely demonstration and, and talk about the experiment station that was on that site. And um, with some really good visuals, I have to say. I learned a lot, Kathy. <laughs> and uh, the kids were really engaged. They did taiko drumming over on the, the Ferris site. They took our um, push cart down to the common. They take history to the streets every year. So they had items in there that they engaged the community as they walked down onto the common. Um, just a variety of things. I don't know, Mary, you want to add anything? But it's, um, it's a remarkable uh, program that's growing. And so we're really excited to have finished up the third year of that. We'll do it again next year. Um, Historic preservation, an ongoing theme. We've been in the Essex Company building since 1992. We've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars from a variety of sources. And um, we continue to, uh, guided by a master plan that was created, um, select 
projects, raise money for projects, prioritize those projects. The one that we completed this past, we just finished it in September, was um, our side staircase at the courtyard entrance to our building was way out of code, hazardous to navigate. <laughs> um, it, the, the rise of the steps was too high. Um, it was too steep, so what we did, the landing was minuscule, so we extended the landing to a full four-foot landing. Um, we reduced the height of the stairs using as much original granite as possible by shading it down, added an additional stair, and added safe railings that are appropriate for the period, um, and then adjusted the, the walkway that was already there. Um, the gentlemen at the top that are inside the staircase, <laughs> um, it's Tompkins Landscaping, they did a really beautiful job, a lot of attention to detail, and um, did a great job, and Sam Salaf did the real work, so we kept local businesses engaged to do that. We have received a grant from the Mass Cultural Council uh, Facilities Fund in the amount of $55,000 to replace our elevator, because it's been decommissioned for a couple of years now. Um, so we're um, in the process of trying to raise match funding. It has to be matched one to one. The total budget is 110,000. We also got a systems replacement plan grant from them in the amount of 7,000. It also has to be matched, but that will um, enable us to assess all of our facilities, all the buildings, all the systems, and really put together a plan and cost estimate as to when things need to be done, um, which is really good for longevity and continuity and leadership and so forth, because you'll have everything that's been done in a spreadsheet and how much we anticipate it costing and so forth. So the roofs will go at some point right now. I'm going to know when. <laughs> um, the American Textile History Museum closed, unfortunately, last year. And they've been winding down in a really breakneck speed, um, faster than they should have been able to. It probably should have taken three years to wind down. They've done it in less than 18 months. Um, we have gotten some collections from them, but the most overwhelming thing that we've gotten from them is metal shelving. Thousands of linear feet of metal shelving that are on those pallets in, and in our carpenter shop waiting for to be reassembled in our outer building. It's going to now enable us to have proper metal shelving in every area of the entire complex. This will take a little while <laughs> to implement, but it forced us to, to look at our, our main building and all the other buildings, and we're going to be in a really fantastic shape in terms of how we care and how's our um, better shape. We're already in good shape, but <laughs> better shape to house and protect our collections long term. Because of this, this is Ray the Rigger, funniest guy you'll ever meet, <laughs> taped together. He's 60 years old, and he's been doing this for his whole career, and he is limping around, and he's awesome. And this little lamby is now in our foyer. He, he's being held by Todd Smith, who's the interim director at the Textile Museum. Um, and that was my proof that I didn't take him, uh, didn't steal the lamby, because I had threatened to do that before. So that, there'll be a lot of things happening at the History Center. And we'll probably have it with the house up and coming when we kind of making some facilities improvements to the main building. Next up, and what we're what our guest speakers are here to talk about and what we've been pushing out since June is our call for papers for the history, for our, our fourth symposium on the history and future of public health. Um, it is uh, prompted by the centennial anniversary of the 1918 influenza pandemic. And um, it, it allows us to um, focus on, pub, on, on influenza, but brought more broadly on public health, what we have in our collections, research that's already been done we're taking a humanities approach to public health, <laughs> which um, is a really unique way to, to do this. In our symposium, we're looking for uh, historical research, but we're also looking to look at the, the current conditions in the city, the current issues that people are facing, whether it be poverty, mental illness, the opioid crisis, um, homelessness, um, and look at how, in the past, how um, epidemics were handled, the civic response that was required then, what is the civic response that's required now? Um, the call for papers, there are copies in the back, it's on our website. Um, the deadline for proposals is December 1st. We give suggested uh, topics, but we will consider anything. So, uh, related to the topic. But, um, <laughs> but So that's coming up on April 7th, and we're really excited for that. And so, uh, discussion, does anyone have any questions for me? Okay, I'm 
Mira. Hey everyone, my name is Anita Kiley and I'm the Collections Manager and Research Coordinator at the Lawrence History Center. I just want to start by saying thank you to Pam, who's been a mentor and encourager from the very beginning when I began as an intern. You've always had advice and encouragement and I really appreciate it and I know I'll continue, you'll continue to offer that just in a different role. I'm um, in Karen, who is the Home Secretary, is on our Collections Committee, which I had, and Karen always has great ideas advice on how to preserve material, where to go to get advice on how to preserve material, um, and it's, it's just a great um, help to me, so I appreciate you and the way you be staying on the board. Um, the most important thing we do at the Lawrence History Center is preserve, protect, and share the materials that are donated to us. We're continuing to get collections donated almost weekly. Since we reopened from our August closing, we've gotten collections every week. We've had a new donation come in. We've even had some days where, some weeks where three days in a row we've had new material donated. Um, and it runs from items that are 100 years old to items that were used um, in Lawrence when Market Basket was having the, the labor <coughs> dispute back in um, 2014. The signs that people held at rallies at the Lawrence as a street market basket. So we collect new items as well as older items. Um, probably in the next few weeks, Susan will be emailing a research article I wrote that gets, goes into more detail about the different collections that were donated and what we've done processing-wise with them. So for now, I'm just, for this meeting, I'm just going to focus on what we've um, worked on with public health, our public health collection. We have some examples in the back of ledgers that are part of our Board of Health records at the Lawrence History Center. These ledgers were saved from basements of the basement of City Hall, Bessie Burke Hospital. It was saved literally from, from wet basements, from dusty locations, maybe even from dumpsters. People made sure to bring them to the History Center. Eartha was the leader in that and making sure we rescued these items. And we've preserved them for years, but we never really identified them as well as they could be identified or wrote about them in as much detail as could be written about. So this, the last several months, Kathy Flynn, our head researcher, is in the back there, and Mary Panos, another volunteer who's not here, have spent hours and hours every day identifying the, the resources. Um, they protected them in enclosures that are labeled, which you'll see um, examples of in the back, and they've organized them. We brought three examples tonight um, of ledgers from the Contagious Disease Department, the Tuberculosis Hospital, and the Sanitation Department. And I have material that will eventually be, create a finding aid to tell all about the resources that we have. So we're so excited to make these available. When before we were just housing them, now we can make them available and share what we have with them. Um, so that's one, one, uh, one area we focused on, but we've done so much more. We've also connected researchers with our archives in ways we never thought would be possible. We had a visit from Bessie M. Burke's daughter, Lena, um, Lana Scholick, earlier this year. Bessie Ann Burke was for whom the Burke Hospital was named, and she um, was a matron there for years. And she and her family had wonderful memories of the hospital and happy patients and good home cooked food and just beautifully maintained grounds. And so the hospital, after they, they stopped working there, kind of went into to disrepair. Eventually it was closed down. Someone took pictures of the hospital when it was closed and did a blog, kind of portraying it as a haunted place with scary patients and people not taking care of it. And when Lana and her family saw that blog, they were heartbroken. So she came to the Lawrence History Center to see what we had on the Burke Hospital and to donate a picture of her mother and her memories that she wrote down at the hospital. And we just had the, the greatest time meeting her, and it, we were pleased that it helped her feel a little bit better. Shortly after that, we received a donation that um, the Helen Carletta Nagy papers. And this woman actually was a nursing aide at the Bessie Burke Hospital, and she had plenty of pictures of the smiling nurses who worked there, of the grounds when they were in beautiful condition, and just a great, great picture of the Bessie Burke Hospital. And so we called Nana, and she was able to see this donation, and she was just so happy because it completely changed her mind on how she thought people saw the hospital. So one person saw it, and it's this repair. But this woman's family experienced a happiness there that Lana also did. So we were so happy to make that connection and show how one donation helps researchers, but it also helps how people feel. It doesn't just help them learn. It helps their, how they feel about the city and maybe how they feel about their family's legacy. Another really neat story this year was a researcher came from New York, and he knew we had family in Lawrence years ago. The no present connection to the city. And as he was researching and talking, 
we were listening, and his story was very similar to one of our volunteers. The names were similar, the addresses were similar where they lived. And then he mentioned a relative who had kind of a, a unique way of dying, and another relative who had a very funny nickname, a unique nickname. And then we figured out he was related to one of our volunteers. So um, his name is Bill Morris, and he was related to Mary Morris Panos. And so Mary came in the next day, her normal volunteer day, and Bill was there, and he met Mary, he met Mary's large family, they went out to lunch, and so he came to the city with no family in the city, and left with family that he didn't know we had, and also, and, and just now he'll have that connection forever, and he was so pleased to, to meet her, and just to find that connection. Um, we focus on making items available digitally, because sometimes people don't know the history center exists, or they don't know we have archives, but they do know how to use Google, so they Google their relative's name, and so often a hit will come up that we have something that their relative either donated or read a story about their relative. Um, many, many times, even as recently as last week, we found that, or a researcher has found, that we have an oral history that their relative did years ago, and that this person didn't know, so a woman called, and we had an interview that her father had done back in 1996. The father passed away kind of long ago, but she didn't know he was ever interviewed. And since we digitized this material from a tape cassette to an MP3, and also entered it in our database, she Googled his name and found it. She didn't know we existed. And so we were able to send her the MP3 file, and she could hear her father's voice again and hear his story. So we're always trying to make more of our collection available digitally, and that's what our volunteers do. We have a wonderful team of volunteers who are so dedicated and so talented and move the organization so far. I don't, I don't know what we would do without them. Um, they just make it a pleasure to go to work as the Susan and the board. Um, it really is just a great place because we have such great leaders and volunteers. Um, I'll be happy to answer any more qu any questions. Um, and again, I'll be sending out a research article that has a little more detail about um, what we've done this year. But I tried to keep it brief for tonight. Um, so thank you, everyone. These are some pictures. Um, we have, we've had a visitor from Japan, University of Tokyo. We spent three weeks at the History Center researching. Also, he spent several weeks at the library, and Louise helped him. Spoke with Jonas Sunza and David, local Lawrence um, Strike and Nineteen Twelve scholars. That's what his research was on. Um, and then there's some pictures. Lana is the lady holding the picture of her mother. Um, the young woman with the Samana Hispana poster. That's in our collection. We have a very large um, Hispanic community collection. And she's a student at Brooks, and she was a, an example of a school group that visited. And I'll just end on the lower left picture um, is me presenting at the fall 2016 New England Archivist Conference. Um, I was asked, the History Center was asked to participate because they were very impressed with the ways in which we made the collection available to all groups. Um, part of our website is translated into Spanish, so that's really what drew them to us. And um, I submitted a proposal to present at the, the fall 2018 meeting, and it was accepted, so I'll be presenting. Um, it's in Connecticut at, at Yale, and presenting on um, kind of a similar topic, how we make um, archives available to kind of underrepresented communities, or people who you wouldn't think would, would be interested in archives. My title was Archives for Everyone, because that's truly what we do at the History Center, as was evident through Susan's report, and all the people that we serve, all levels of scholars, like Pam said. So, thank you, everyone. representing the Public Health Museum. Um, Ashton Rickard, the, Rickard, sorry, the director, who's passing out um, pamphlets. And we have Linda Perry, who is the museum's treasurer and volunteer coordinator. And we have Kathy DeMova, who's the um, museum president. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, we're very pleased to be here, and we didn't really know too much about you, and now we know quite a bit more. I'm very impressed with your organization. Um, and this is a really wonderful opportunity uh, for us to share with you what the Public Health Museum is all about. Um, the museum is a nonprofit educational and cultural museum dedicated to preserving artifacts and records of our nation's history and public health. It's located in Tewksbury, and it's housed in the old administration building of the Tewksbury Hospital campus. Um, 
Uh, I was Mother Jewsbury was founded in 1852 and has been in continuous um, organization since then, uh, providing care to um, many types of uh, medical patients and, and even more recently psychiatric patients. Um, the city of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are rich in history, but few know the integral role that they played in the development of public health in the United States. As early as the 1700s, Boston, serving as the first line of defense against smallpox, held ships, ships quarantined as the first line of defense. And in 1796, Boston established the first board of public health in the nation and the first sitting president of Paul Revere. Um, and we will show you pictures of the board of health annual uh, reports later in our presentation. This is, this is the location of the museum in this building, which is part of the National Historic Register. Uh, so we're going to share with you some of the objects that we have, um, trying to show you uh, the nature of the museum, and obviously invite you to come and visit. So, Ashlyn and Linda, please. So it would be a mini kind of tour, although you can't be there in person with us um, at the museum. Um, this will kind of be a walkthrough of the different rooms um, that we have in the museum and the different um, content we showcase. So um, first, obviously, Kathy mentioned that we're on the Tewksbury Hospital. Um, so we have a very rich history of the Tewksbury Hospital and Alms House as what it was in the beginning. Um, so this is just a sh small um, snippet of the admissions ledgers we have um, dating back from 1854 up until I don't even know when the last ledgers we got in from 1970 or so. Um, so these are the actually the oldest ledgers, so that's why they look um, a little rough, uh, but they are bounded and have been digitized through the University of Massachusetts Lowell, um, so you can actually find those online. And I do have some handouts up here related um, to those records and some of the other resources we have at the museum. Um, but these are, you know, a fantastic piece of our collection. So if you're interested in researching, you know, maybe a family member who was at the Tewksbury Hospital, um, we may have collections, um, and, uh, you know, their um, admissions records from their admission to the hospital. You want to do this thing? Oh, okay. <laughs> so what we were doing kind of is taking a little bit of a walk through the museum. So as they said, we started with uh, the admissions records and we do a lot of Tewksbury history because it is such a long-standing public institution and a lot of people are coming and want to know about the history of, of Tewksbury. Um, so we show some other artifacts as well and, what, and we go into a room where we have artifacts uh, from other hospitals <coughs> like uh, Lakeville Hospital and on that desk we have this wonderful old uh, pharmacy book that dates back to about 1903 and has the pharmacy uh, write outs up until about 1910 and 1911. Uh, and we always tell people, look, you can actually read the writing. <laughs> so, this snippet, um, if you can see it right there, um, this that is from 1905. That one was 1905. These pages. Um, and although we don't exactly know which institution it was, obviously um, the whole pharmacy book is Lowell. So, pretty close by your neighbors. Um, so, that's what we thought would be um, worth noting is you know how the Lowell pharmacy book we have um, all the way from back then. So then we go into um, an infectious disease room that we have a number of different things. And one of the uh, really fun uh, exhibits that we have is this uh, patent medicine display, uh, which covers an awful lot of um, medicines dating back to whenever. Um, one of the ones that we thought was really uh, kind of neat was um, Moxie, which we just got as a as a, a, a donation to add to our uh, TV exhibit. Um, and many of you probably don't know, you know about Moxie as a soda, right? Uh, you might not know that Moxie was actually started um, as a patent medicine to cure TB. That's what they said it would do. It started out as a root from uh, South America, and that's what they thought it was going to do for you. Uh, our other bottle, too is um, pain celery compound. I don't think any of you are old enough to have 
use these, but <laughs> in case you've ever heard of pain celery compounds. So we have some nice stories about some of the patent medicines that we have. Um, and a lot of them came from this area. Uh, you probably will know about um, Father John's in Lowell and uh, the AR company and uh, maybe Lydia Pinkham from uh, uh, Lynn, Massachusetts. So uh, we've got a great collection there and uh, lots of good stories to talk about. Were patent medicines really patented? No, no. It, it has to do with, I'm sorry, I should have looked it up before I came. It has to do with England and how it was used for the king. The king having to okay the yeah. medicines, and, but it's no, they weren't patented in that, in that sense. It was a whole different word structure, yeah. So, yeah, so um, as we continue in the infectious disease room, we actually try to focus on several infectious diseases like polio. This is probably our main attraction. Most people um, that come have heard that we have an iron lung and are anxious to see that. So we have actually quite a good display on uh, polio and again, a lot of good stories to tell about, for instance, do you know who coined the term the March of Dimes? How many of you have heard of Eddie Cantor? <laughs> he was actually the person who coined it. He was a friend of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's and he um, was on the board of the National Infantile Paralysis Foundation. He had a uh, radio show called The March of Times, and he said, oh, if we got people to send a dime to the president, we could have the March of Times. And that's how that started. So there's some good stories. Um, Other to go on. Yeah. Um, pieces in our infectious disease room include smallpox, um, and then the other big one is tuberculosis, um, which we're showcasing here, the Christmas seals. Uh, we just redid our tuberculosis exhibit at the museum, and then we had a large launch party, as you say, um, in March 24th of this year um, on World TV Day. So obviously, well, you can probably tell better stories about Christmas seals than I can, um, but these are some of the ones we have on display, and as Linda showed you, we also have these. You want to talk more about that? Yeah. No, I, no, I think, um, I think the rest of the exhibit is actually much more interesting than just these Christmas seals. So we just want to entice you to come and look. Um, as she mentioned, we did a reworking of that whole exhibit, and we have some pretty neat things like um, a pneumothorax machine that they used to use. Uh, and when they used it, they would put ping pong balls into your chest to keep your lung deflated. So come and hear more about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a specific piece of Lauren's history here is regarding water purification. Um, as you mentioned, the Lawrence um, experiment some station, station. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere it was mentioned. Um, so, you know, this is a part of our museum talking about the um, work that the Lawrence experiment station had um, you know, contributed to water purification um, and healthy drinking. Yeah. And it's really known worldwide in case I'm sure you guys all know about it much more than we do. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell us more information. Exactly. Add more. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So one of our other um, rooms that we try to do some uh, exhibits about is for mental health. Uh, many people did know about Tewksbury as a mental health hospital. It was much, much more than that, but <coughs> it was certainly also a large part of it. And this is an example of what a patient would have, how the patient would have been arranged for uh, insulin coma therapy. Um, in addition, so restraining, so I guess I could mm -hmm. this, um, we had an event to um, bring kids in from Tewksbury um, High School for our outbreak program, which is a summer program very similar. You know, I know you guys do a great summer program too, um, which is teaches high school students, juniors and seniors um, on public health and introduces them to careers in the field as well. Um, so I was actually at Tewksbury Hospital um, tabling for that. And when I put this on, kids went silent. They <laughs> ran over and they're like, what is that? But um, obviously, you know, it was restrained. You put your hands on the side and your hands would be restrained. So it was like hard to do. <laughs> so, and we also have in that room, as uh, you see on the next slide, we talk about occupational therapy, uh, recreational therapy, uh, we have a uniform from Denver State Hospital, uh, their baseball team, and a few other things. Um, mm -hmm. Which I know is some other things, yeah. But just noteworthy um, as one of the points of interest 
or the Public Health Symposium was Occupational Health. Um, so there's some resources we have at the museum that could relate to the history of occupational health in state hospitals and state schools and um, institutions like Tewksbury. Okay, um, so we do have a room that we dedicate to um, education in public health, particularly nursing education. Uh, we, we're showing here the um, nurse's cape that they received when they graduated for many, many years, uh, a student nurse's uniform. We have um, a lovely story to tell about um, Margaret Ward, who this is a book of hers from 1919, uh, and it turns out that her granddaughter donated this as well as uh, some other articles um, and is now a docent at the museum uh, following up on her grandmother's, uh, her grandmother graduated from the Tewksbury School of Nursing in I think it's 1922. And so there's some nice stories about that. And this book is from 1990. So she would have um, been using that. So um, we have a dental room, which I have to say, before I came to uh, volunteer at the, at the uh, museum, I just never thought about dentistry as part of public health. It just wasn't on my horizon. <laughs> but it actually is a large part of public health and has been you know, since before the World Wars because, of course, they found that um, soldiers didn't have very good uh, medical conditions, a lot of times based on their uh, dental conditions. And so we, um, we have some lovely stories to tell. We have uh, uh, a book here that shows instruments. instruments yeah. We have this traveling <laughs> dental chair that was used. You would fold it up and put it into the wooden box, and it would be carted around um, and give you your dentist. And so who was a famous dentist in Boston just before the American Revolution who was also a famous silversmith? Paul Revere. And many, many people don't know that he was also a dentist. Uh, what's really interesting, I will just tell you, is he was considered the first forensic dentist because he worked on his friend, Dr. Joseph Warren, did, did dental work on him. And Warren was killed at the Battle of Reedsville, later known as Bunker Hill. And they couldn't identify him because he was um, mutilated so badly. And Paul Revere identified him based on the dental work that he did, so he's considered the first forensic dentist. So we have another couple, we have a good story about George Washington that you have to come here. Was Paul Revere one of the first public health commissioners? He was. First, first one in Boston. Boston was the first one, first city in the nation. And um, just to, you know, this presentation has both um, artifacts and archives. Um, so in addition to the admissions records that we have um, and records related to the Tewksbury Hospital. We have much more than that. Um, and this is just, once again, just a snippet of what we have in our archives that are available towards to researchers, which might be um, very useful for the symposium in the spring. Um, so this is, once again, just a snippet of the Board of Health annual reports. Um, so we have them ranging, gosh, from late 1800s all the way until I mean, recent, more recent times. Um, so you know these are available for researchers to utilize. Um, in addition to other archival items that we have, we have very subject-specific content, so things related to public health nursing, things related to dentistry. We also have some records, um, for instance, from we have something from Danvers State Hospital, the um, building plans basically for Danvers State Hospital in a book form. Um, in addition to other things from local um, institutions, public health institutions in Massachusetts, um, and a plethora of other related archives. So our last room, uh, we call the mural room because if you were there to see, we have these lovely murals done in the 1930s uh, during the Works Progress Administration around the room. One of the things that was also done during that time period was this large map that you see that we have hanging on our wall. And we thought it would be appropriate to end with this map to show you the insert on the map that's right here. about Lawrence and the textile. Uh, center there. The map is very interesting because it shows, you know, the sea monsters and all kinds of <laughs> things that were of, of interest back then. Um, and that pretty much um, is the end of our tour. Uh, we've left out an awful lot of things, uh, but we wanted to just give you a smattering of the kinds of things that are there, uh, a few of the stories that we can tell and tell people about, and you can <laughs> tell what we're interested in. 
further. Well, I hope this has enticed you to just make that little short trip over to Tewksbury, come visit us, and um, show you the rest of it. There is also a, an outside tour, which is around the campus, and the campus is 950 acres. Um, we don't quite go that far. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to go that <laughs> um, But we're looking forward to uh, joining you in your symposium in April on uh, public health, and uh, we had some discussion about the uh, taken over as a state institution? No. Or was it established first as a state yeah. institution? It was actually one of three first state institutions in the nation. Uh, to, in 52, as she mentioned, um, the legislature of Massachusetts had for three almshouses to be built. And one was at Tewksbury, one was at Bridgewater, uh, Bridge, and one it was in Munson, yeah. And they were originally almshouses. For the poor, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, but it was always the state. It's always okay. been the state since day one. Not the county. I was thinking it might have been Middlesex County. No, mm -hmm. not the county. Mm -hmm. That remains the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, uh, you mentioned Father John's Medicine, famously mm -hmm. originated in Lowell. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did, do, you have, do you have a bottle in the collection? <laughs> Um, I am sure there are, but I can't think of exactly which one is Father John's. I would hope that we do. I have one that still has the medicine in it. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, if you I ever want to find a place for it, I'll it for it. I can testify yeah. to the vile taste of <laughs> Father John's, which I was forced to as a child. No. We won't go into that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That was restraints. My father had to do